Hi, this is Mr. Curtis, and today what we're going to do is be studying and looking at the skeletal systems. There are basically three functions to the skeleton, or any skeletal system. There's support, protection, and movement. Starting with support. Now this animal, for example, this is a jellyfish, does it have a skeleton? Uh, the answer is no. There's no skeleton, but does it have support? Absolutely. The water surrounding this animal gives it the support that it needs. What about this animal? Does it have a skeleton? Again, the answer is no. There's no skeleton there, but yes, it does have support. How about this animal? Does it have a skeleton? Wee oui, wee. Oui. There is a skeleton there. Because if you've ever seen it, um, a snake skeleton looks like this. Now we also have poor Peter, who once upon a time lost his skeleton. And what about boneless chickens? When you go to McDonald's and it says you have boneless chicken meat, where did that come from? Uh, came from this animal, right? Now let's move on to protection. Obviously this crab here is getting a lot of protection from its skeleton. And so is this clam. We too get protection from our skeleton. Our rib cage protects the lungs and heart. And our cranium, skull, protects our brain. And movement. The skeleton allows our bodies to move. It gives muscles a place to attach, which then helps, move, helps us with the movement. There are two types of skeletons. There is an exoskeleton and endoskeleton. Look closely at the prefixes. Exo and endo. That should tell you something. Exo means outside. And endo means inside. Terrible handwriting today. So let's talk first about an exoskeleton. Like a crayfish here, it has uh, its skeleton on the outside, or a crab. Now what about a turtle? Does it have an exoskeleton? Uh, the answer is Niet comrade. It's actually a modified skin. Its skeleton is an endoskeleton. Now, back to exoskeletons, what are the advantages? You have better protection. The disadvantage is you have to shed every time that you grow. And they're also heavy and harder to move. Here is a lobster as an example, and you can see that here is the old skeleton that's being shed and you can see that there's a new skeleton underneath. Imagine every time you grow at this stage of your life you having to shed something on the outside like that. That would be a big pain. So there are some definite disadvantages to an exoskeleton. An endoskeleton, the advantages are it's easier to move. It's much quicker and easier for a rabbit to move than, let's say, a crab. You also grow. And when you grow, the skeleton grows along with it. The disadvantage, obviously, is there's less protection. Places where bones come together are called joints. There are over 10 different types of joints. We're going to focus our attention on three types a hinge joint, ball and socket, and a fixed joint. Here we have a hinge joint. This would be the upper arm bone, that would be the humerus. Here we have the one of the lower arm bones, that's the radius, and here's the other one, this is the ulna. And where your elbow moves, that's called a hinge. It's called a hinge because it looks like the hinge of a door and move something similar to that. A ball and socket 
you have a ball that sits into a C-like cup, and that would be an example, for example, in your hip is a ball and socket joint. Here we have what's called a fixed joint. All the little cracks and so on that you see in your cranium, in your skull, that would be a fixed joint. How do you get those? Where did they come from? Here's an overhead view of a baby's skull. And when a baby is growing, the skull will start in a small spot. The skull bones will start here and they grow out and they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And where they come together, you have these fissures, these fixed points. Anyone who's been around a baby knows that a baby has a soft spot. There's a place here on the top of its head where there's no bone. That's because they haven't grown together yet. In order for a baby to be born, it has to have that in order to go through mom's birth canal and her pelvis. Otherwise, the baby won't fit. It'll be too big. There are two basic ways in which bones are connected. You have bone to bone. Those are ligaments. And you have muscle to bone, which are tendons. Here's a picture of the most common tendon, or one that we know a lot about, the Achilles. And actually, the strands of that Achilles tendon go way, way up into your calf muscle. They're way up here. And then they all concentrate down at the very bottom, right where your ankle is. And that makes it very, very strong by doing that. This is a drawing of a anterior cruciate ligament, which oftentimes is referred to as an ACL. On the inside here, this would be what's called the medial collateral. This is the lateral collateral ligament. In the back here, this is something called the posterior. Posterior means behind. Anterior means front. And here, is the torn ACL. This is what I had happen to me, and a lot of people have that happen. This would be right under where the kneecap would be. So the kneecap would be right here, and this is underneath it. Bones are also alive. We often think that you know that's they're not alive. Yes, they are, and they can grow and repair. Here's a, a poor devil who's got a broken clavicle broken collarbone. Maybe this is Aaron Rodgers from a few years ago. But uh, if bones did not uh, mend themselves, obviously we'd be in deep doo-doo. They do mend themselves, which means that they are alive. I also want you to write this down, that we basically have two types of tissues within our skeletal system. We have bone, and then we also have cartilage. Bone, as you know, is very hard. Cartilage can be hard or it can be soft. And there's basic, there's two types of cartilage. There is soft cartilage and there is hard cartilage. Hard cartilage would be found at the ends of these bones. That's where you'd find that. Soft cartilage you would find in the end of somebody's nose. I'll put a couple nasal hairs there. So that the wiggly part at the end of your nose, that's soft. Also, the stuff in your ears would be considered soft cartilage. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about types of levers. There's first, second, and third class. A first class lever works like this, where you have something called the fulcrum. That's the pivot point. And the load is here. The effort to push down is here. So if you think of some first-class levers, that would include things like pliers, scissors, a shovel. All of those are first-class levers. A second-class lever. Here, the fulcrum changes. So now, 
the fulcrum is at the end. That's the pivot point. The effort, the part where you push up, is here. The load is here. What does that look like? Hmm. A wheelbarrow is a second class lever. And third class, now we have the fulcrum in a similar place, but now the load is way out on the end, and the effort is here in the middle. Hmm, what could that be? All you uh, people who like to fish should know that a fishing pole is a third class lever. The fulcrum is down here, the effort is here, and the weight is over here. That makes it a third class lever. What does this have to do with the skeletal system? Well, your joints, the ones that move at least, are different types of those lever classes. Let's look at this one, for example, and see if we can figure out what kind of, what class of lever this would be. Well, here's the pivot point, so you know that has to be the fulcrum. And the load is right here. I'll leave the rest to you to figure out which kind of lever that is. And please write this down on your sheet of paper as to what type this is. All right, that's the end of our study of skeletal notes. Please make sure that you have a summary. And also, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, write those down. And we will see you next time.